Thank you. Um, thanks also for organizing the workshop, also to Chris. I really appreciate that there is such a workshop. I think it's great to have something devoted to that. And I was really looking forward to it. And I'm still enjoying it, of course. So it's good all the age. It's a method for always being invited to exotic places, isn't it? Is it? Yeah, <laughs> OK, is that an exotic place? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> it's the most exotic place I've ever seen, but OK. <laughs> Anyway, I will um, talk about work that was done together with Lydia Del Rio, Nuria Nurgalieva, who is a PhD student in the group, and Simon Mattis, who is a master student also in the group in at ETH Zurich. So, um, actually, I, I changed um, the slides quite a lot um, since, um, let's say, this morning, because I really like the introduction that Chris gave or in particular like this picture, maybe that's, I shouldn't give credit to you, but rather to John Wheeler. And because I think it kind of really fits um, to what I'm, I would like to talk about today. And I should also um, maybe as an outlook say that, of course, the whole thing will be directed towards the SOT experiment that I developed together with Daniela Frau here, but it will not be a talk about that. It will rather be a talk that should go um, like point towards the next step that I would like to take to better understand what's going on there. Okay, so um, I guess you know what this picture means. And I just want to, in this talk, often talk about physical theories. And so the question is, how do physical theories fit into this picture? And one way to see that is to say that we have users of a physical theory. So, um, we are all users, which doesn't mean we are not also part of the physical theory, of course, but clearly we are users of the theory. And I will, um, I think in accordance to what I repeatedly hear, in particular from the people here in front, in the front row, um, an agent is essentially a user of the theory. I think this is something we would still agree on. And um, on the other hand, we have the scope of the theory. So the, the theory tries to describe something. Um, what this is, is I think, so this picture really allows me not to use words. It's, it's probably clear. It describes something. Now, um, just to stress that, I will really not use the term in any different sense. So in particular, we're not talking about anything like consciousness. I just, I think here, this doesn't even have to be said. But sometimes when you give a talk to a more general audience, they immediately think of conscious agents. So this is not the point here. It's really about users of the theory. Now, of course, in general, we may ask, what is, how is the agent and the scope of the theory related to each other? Are there certain constraints? And there are, in principle, um, like two extreme cases. We could say we really regard the agent as one part of this U and the scope of the theory as something else. Or maybe one shouldn't, yeah, I mean, it's clearly one part takes the end of, the, of, the, of this U is supposed to be an agent, and the other end is something physical. So they could still be completely separated. And I think this is actually how we, use, we usually use physical theories. And the other extreme case would be that we somehow say we are agent is part of the world and the, the theory should describe the entire world. And therefore, the agent has to be part of the theory. But for most theories we have, this is probably not well defined. And um, I think. Rüdiger gave a very nice example with the betting on black coffee that, for example, in cubism, this wouldn't even make sense, as I think you termed it. And um, the same thing is just, I think, more generally true for many interpretations of quantum mechanics that it's at least not defined. It doesn't probably mean that you couldn't define it. That's not the claim. But a priori, it's not defined what you would do. Because it would kind of, would you now incorporate the fact that you immediately learned something that this changes your state and so on? How would you deal with that? And there has, of course, been a lot of work already to, um, um, like some no-go theorems in about the recurse, recursive use of, of a theory, of a physical theory and so on, which is not the topic of this talk. And you see already from the title, this is a single agent scenario. And I think these are just the two extreme cases we have in the single agent scenario. And um, everything is probably somewhere in between. However, and this is really what I'm going to talk about, um, which is the scenario we have all the time. For example, I wouldn't give this talk if I, I was the single agent here. We have multi-agent scenarios. And in these scenarios, 
one could think maybe the U has several um, parts. That would be one thing. You, in the classical case, they may get disconnected, as um, Chris um, illustrated. And we could have now situations where, indeed, so I guess the color code is clear. Like there is a green agent, and the green agent has a certain scope of the theory he uses. This could, of course, be the same theory that B uses, but maybe applied in a different way on a, or on a different system. But it could even be a different theory, if you like. And agent B, he has a, another range or scope of the theory he uses, and there may be intersections between the scopes of this theory. So that's a more kind of interesting scenario, which doesn't suffer from the problem that we have a recursive use of the theory in the sense um, that you saw on the previous slide. Of course, we could now have many different extreme cases. For example, an extreme case would be that the agents, both agents, are just out of the scopes of each other's theories. We could also have cases where, for example, one agent is kind of, um, in some way, um, more general or outside, if you like. Whether it m being outside means that um, like, uh, he makes more true statements or truer statements. How that's not clear, but that's sometimes implicitly assumed, by the way, if you think about many or like s such hierarchies. And one always thinks, oh, the guy who is more outside has kind of the better view on it, which I wouldn't subscribe. And I think also, um, I remember Chris um, once made the point that um, quantum theory is quite the opposite. We have to be inside um, to actually know things. And so it's not clear who is here, for example, the better agent in the sense that he has more accurate information, or probably they're not comparable. So. Um, but just to say there may be hierarchies in principle. And um, we may now try to make statements about these different situations. Now let me um, just say this is not something, of course I will only talk about quantum zero, that's what I have in mind. However, um, such considerations also enter, for example, thermodynamics. When you, and actually when you talk um, concretely about something like Maxwell's demon and want to resolve it, you actually have to view things like that. There's a, an out outside agent. Um, maybe that's usually us who see a term or look at a thermodynamic system from a macroscopic viewpoint. And there is the macroscope and, and there is the Maxwell demon who is inside the system. So it would be like on this previous slide, maybe more something like B. And then usually the paradoxes arise because one interchanges the two views without noticing and then get some contradictory results. But if, as long as you're aware that there are different agents who talk about different parts and have certain consistency rules, which in this case are important, um, otherwise you still ain't, um, get a paradox in Maxwell's demon. You have, for example, to be aware that if agent B learns something and you're the agent A outside, you have to um, assign a higher entropy to the system and, and stuff like that. So we have certain rules to fulfill, but then you want to be consistent in that sense. Now, when does a consistency test work? Someone could say the least thing that has to be satisfied is, is that the series have to have some overlap in scope. Maybe they talk about the same measurement outcome. And um, I know that Rüdiger will probably not like that because he made just in his talk the point that two agents never see the same thing. Let me nevertheless for the moment leave with that and say, um, for ex I mean, this could be a kind of, I mean, it's obvious that we have all different views. On the other hand, we would hope that if there is any way we can interact as agents, then there are certain maybe more abstract statements, like the statement, we all agree we are in this room. That's a statement which obviously I see the room from a different part than you do, but we can still agree what it means to be in the room or not to be in the room. And of course, I, I understand one can go to an extreme and say this is never possible. I don't want to make that for the moment because then I would have to stop the talk here and say we can never, I mean, there's nothing common we can ever talk about. And that's then a multi-agent scenario is not interesting in that sense. So we have to find some ground, some minimal thing where we can, about which we can talk. I mean, this is not really now a statement about nature. It's more a statement about my talk. I would otherwise just stop the talk here and say we cannot say anything more. That's an option, and that's a logical possibility. But if I believed it, I would anyway not give talks, because, I mean, <laughs> it wouldn't. <laughs> so anyway, um, so, but there is still now um, a subtlety. Because I would still claim in this scenario, it doesn't make sense to compare it. Um, 
if one takes still more general view, like um, the view that is usually proposed by Chaslov and many others about observer-dependent facts, because you could say, okay, there's maybe something we can both talk about, like the statement whether um, we are now in this room or someone, whether Chris is in this room, to just be very pre more precise what it means. And then still there could be two agents who have now somehow different views on that. And you could say, okay, that's fine because they're just two observer-dependent this is an observer-dependent fact, and someone could see him in the room, and the other, or for the other one, it could be a fact that he's not in the room. But what I want to talk about is a, kind of a slightly different situation, where we have not just two agents who are outside, but rather I have an agent outside and another agent who is described by A, who is part of the scope of the theory of A. Of course, from A's point of view, this is maybe not just an agent, but also a physical system. That's what, it mean, what this means. A could still also be part of B. I wouldn't mind, but for simplicity, I take him out. And then we could still now try to make this statement. But now the important difference to the previous one is now agent A in his theory, in his reasoning, talks about B. This is not possible. Let me briefly go back. This was not possible here. H and A had no means to actually talk about B. Of course, he knows B is also talking about this system, but he can never know what B knows because um, A's um, scope doesn't include the agent itself. So it doesn't make sense for A to talk about what B knows because it's simply not part of the setting. So that's why I need to take B in. And in this case, because it, this is now included in the scope about which A, A can reason, it makes sense for A to reason about B. And he may now, in his reasoning, come to the conclusion that actually B, in her own reasoning, comes to the opposite conclusion. And then one could say, and that's this assumption that I usually call C, or it's there an assumption, one could say this is, could now be treated as a contradiction. So let me um, just be very clear. This is not a logical contradiction because there's always this thing about what does consistency mean. I really don't, when it, I now talk about consistency tests, I will not always say it, but what I mean is that um, if we have such a situation, we say this is undesirable. It's maybe logically possible, but this is not what we want because this is exactly, we, if we had that, we would, it would really be um, pose major difficulties in how we interact. Maybe we want to have something weaker or so, but let's just for the moment say this is what I now call a consistency check. We want that if agent A and agent B use the same theory, then it shouldn't happen that agent A comes to the conclusion within his reasoning that agent B comes to the opposite conclusion about something they can both talk about. And what I yes? ask you a point of clarification about that. Uh, because it seems it could be the case uh, if you consider, say, reference frames in relativity that this is unproblematic. Like if Z is the direction of spin along some axis, mm -hmm. maybe agent B is just upside down. Yes, right, yes. And then they can yes. perfectly understand why they yes. give yes. different I think this answers. This is a very good point and I don't think I have a definitive answer, but maybe one could say that the following. Um, before I said we have to talk about the statement we can in principle agree on. For example, the statement, is Chris in this room or not? Now, in principle, it's thinkable that there, is, like, there are two references in which inside and outside are somehow interchanged. This would be hard to imagine, but that would be possible indeed. So that's why I don't have a definitive answer. But let's suppose there are statements which we can make where the statements themselves would include all references. For example, I would say, I define this room. This is part of the statement. So the room defined with this as the inside contains Chris at that time. And then, of course, I have to give it reference for time and so on. But let's suppose there are statements where we include all known things that could be relative in some way. And of course, what could happen is that there is something relative which you are not aware of, that there is some reference for something. Yeah, it's hard to give an example, but yes. Um, because I don't know what it could be otherwise. But um, let's suppose, I mean, <laughs> suppose there are statements, or let's suppose it's possible in principle to make complete statements that are well defined in that sense, that there's no longer a reference that I have to add. And otherwise, I just add it. So in relativity, I would say I see. So have to you can, in principle, if you include the reference frame as an extra physical yes. system, then it is unambiguous to say right, that. Yes. 
Um, but the question yeah. is whether it's always possible to add sufficient reference frames so that it's, it could be a hierarchy. That whenever I include a reference, there's something, again, outside that I have to add. That may happen. I mean, we haven't examples for that. I don't know of any example, but it's a possibility. But I think it's reasonable to assume that there may be, or there should be statements about which that can be um, unambiguously phrased in, in the sense that it makes sense to, that we both talk about them without specifying further, or if you have to specify further things, we specify them. But thanks for the question. That's uh, something that is very often, um, let's say, mentioned in this context, and I should have said it anyway. But the proposal now, um, okay, now it's just the spelling error. Anyway, the proposal is that one, um, this is just a test for a theory in the same sense as locality is a test. So this again emphasizes, or is a property a theory could have. This again emphasizes it's not a logical necessity in the same way as it's not logically necessary that a theory is local. But you can view that just as such a property. Like we have theories and we want to make statements about what features theories have, and one feature could be a theory is consistent, is agent consistent. Maybe you, someone finds a better term for that. I don't want to propose um, now something that should stay as a term, but the proposal is that this is something we could just see as a property a theory could have, and I would say it's probably a desirable property, but that's then something one could discuss. It's at least a property we use in daily life all the time, and um, that's certainly a, something one could say. Okay, so then um, I should add, when I here say a theory should have, so we could ask the question, does a theory have this property? When I talk about the theory, of course we need really to be precise what the theory means. And for example, we have just heard um, in um, the talk, okay, this was I think still in the APS meeting, but I think many of us have heard the talk by Joslav that for example, it could be that in certain situations an agent has two quantum states or even more. And, there has um, and of course, we know how to deal with each individual quantum state, but then if we are in such a situation, then there should be an additional rule which tells us how do we now deal with those, how do we use them. And so this all has to be specified. So I'm just saying that when we talk about the theory, it's not just a formal theory, it includes a full specification of how we apply the theory to concrete scenarios. For example, the thought experiments that we have. You should know what to do what state is now the relevant state in this particular thought experiment and so on. And so this should just be included in the word theory for the moment for the purpose of this talk. So it's, that's um, something one has to be aware of. Now let me just briefly um, go back to the Wigner's friend example, which this workshop is about, I suppose. And um, to make the point that, um, of course, what the advantage of this kind of thing is, is that we are not now and bringing in additional elements that need interpretation apart from outcomes. And of course, usually the way one talks about the Wigner's friend experiment is that one has kind of a disagreement about the state. And then the contradiction comes from interpreting the state as in different ways. But here, um, it should really be at the end about only statements about outcomes and the rules have to be specified. So let me just to illustrate what I mean here, make an e example of um, that there are um, like different ways of viewing, let's say, Wigner status. I mean, and this also illustrates the point I just made before, that when someone just tells me apply quantum theory to Wigner's friend scenario, I have in principle various choices to apply the formalism and one could, it's not absolutely well defined which of them is the correct use. I think the usual one is this to say in the Wigner's friend thought experiment, um, I could ask myself, so Wigner could, this is maybe not the standard thing, but if Wigner could try to write down the state that the friend would assign to the outcome once, or let's suppose the friend measures the outcome and then the, um, let's say he measures spin up and then of course he knows the spin is now up and he could denote that as a state rather than talking about the outcome. But let's suppose here it's something um, that gives zero and one. And so that's the usual thing. So if Wigner knows either the outcome, so we are in one of these branches, the outcome was one and the friend saw it was um, uh, is zero and the friend saw it was zero and now made this statement assignment zero. But here we of course already make an assumption about what state assignments do, does the friend make. 
And this is now very much related to what Chaslav said, because an alternative could be that the friend is actually aware of the fact that there is this outside description. And if the friend is aware of the outside description, he could say, whatever I actually see, I just ignore that, because maybe the outside description is the um, more um, is the more real one, or I don't know how one should call that, but it's the one I should prioritize. And so his state assignment would actually also be a state assignment where there is still a superposition. And if he could even do that when he doesn't want to talk about himself. He would then just say, OK, I know there is a superposition, and I cannot consider me, so I have to trace out myself. And in this case, there is a density operator. And this density operator, of course, of the system after he measured is just a mixed state. So this is just to say if the friend essentially ignores what he sees, then this state here um, is a completely mixed state, which is indicated here. And if Wigner knows that friend, the friend uses the seer in that way, then of course he makes now this state assignment. He knows the friend has actually seen zero, but still thinks this spin is in, in a mixed state and, and so on. So this is just um, to illustrate that there are really ambiguities in principle. And actually, most of the discussion that um, I had about the thought experiment we proposed was exactly about this difference. Many people said this is actually the way one should use it in this experiment, because this would resolve the um, kind of contradiction. But OK, I will come back to that a bit later. But just to say, this is not an absurd variant. This was really usually proposed as the solution to the paradox. OK, but um, again, the point here is that um, we have to be very precise about what that means and so on. And um, for the, nevertheless, for the consistency check and to avoid um, things I would, for the moment, um, always say we are only at the end comparing outcomes. So whenever H and A talks about B, of course, he may, in the simulation of B, need to reason about the state assigned to B. But at the end, we would not say it's a contradiction if this is not a statement about an outcome. But this has again to do with the question that was asked. At the end, there have to be certain things we can all talk about. And quantum states are probably not the things we want to agree on, because they're anyway subjective things. And there should, so we, we focus on outcomes. OK, maybe I've stressed that now almost too much. But let me now um, come to how this relates to the thought experiment that I proposed with Daniela Frauchiger. Um, but just um, let me as a so short um, um, kind of or use this opportunity before I talk about that to actually, um, as many of, of those people who were involved in the discussions which evolved here, um, thank them for, for the patience they had. I think in particular Rüdiger had to answer so many emails from myself that I felt, to, felt bad sometimes. And <laughs> I actually looked up um, how many emails I exchanged with him. It's an enormous number. So, And um, the same is true for many others. I think I had also many discussions with Chaslav. Not that many emails as with Rüdiger and with Chris and so on. And so I would really like to thank them. And um, this is just, by the way, I, I just looked that up for fun because this was the first time um, Daniela actually talked about the result. And you see many of the people here are around. I mean, Chris and Rüdiger. And there's also Charlie Bennett, who was there, and Gilles Brassa. By the way, this is Daniela, for those who have never seen her. Lydia is there, and so on. So um, I think Joslav was, you were not there, I guess. Yeah. Because not everyone is usually on the pictures. There are those people who missed the vote time. This was in Zurich, actually, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, that's the usual thing. Yes. <laughs> anyway, this is. We saw Charlie Bennett yesterday. And oh. <laughs> it, to my great surprise, he had wished he was here because okay. he wanted That's to discuss exactly your thought experiment. OK, so he didn't appear. Uh, I didn't invite him. I never imagined he would care. OK. But he did. No, he cares about such yes, things, obviously, yes. Him. And Chil Brasser also, by the way, just to, so this is the development of BB84. Um, and I can also now. Um, um, because you asked the question yesterday when I gave the talk, and I want to clarify that, and which and this has to do with that. So the thought experiment actually never changed in the development. However, what we write about them and how we interpret them has constantly changed and, I would say, evolved over the years. And this is really thanks to the many discussions with people I had. And um, so indeed, in the 
actually, I, in the original talk, um, it was already single world things and then in the archive paper as well. But later, um, it's now not even um, about parallel worlds. So I want to clarify that. So it's indeed true that um, in the original paper, we thought that the problem is avoided by um, Everett type interpretations. And in the meantime, I don't, don't any longer think like so. And um, I think you have those who were at the APS meeting, ha meeting have probably seen the talk by Katrin where she gave some arguments why this is the case. But I would really see this as an extension. So the more I thought about the thought experiment, the more interpretation I thought have problems satisfying the axioms now, or the, the postulates. Now, of course, that doesn't mean I want to rule them out. But what it means, for example, for cubism or relational quantum mechanics is that they don't satisfy us this consistency assumption. And what I now want to discuss is, um, I, of course, we just don't have that. And um, in cubism, you could say cubism is anyway not a theory that was telling us what rules should be satisfied when we have different agents. But maybe one wants at some point to have an extension of these theories that tell us how to deal in multi with multi-agent scenarios. And so I think the goal should be for interpretations or for, for approaches to quantum mechanics to at least m be able to make a statement. I think they shouldn't ignore it. And there I probably still agree with, uh, disagree with Rüdiger. I would say I'm not satisfied with just saying we can anyway not talk about common things because we always have different things. I think I would say we should somewhere find certain, a certain common ground because that's what we do all the time when we talk. And, um, but um, to illustrate that, I have to go a bit further. So um, I will now not describe this thought experiment um, because this is kind of a, um, would take a lot of time. But just give the relation how this whole thing fits into what I told you before. So in this thought experiment, we have several agents who do who all can reason. Uh, so they are users of the theory. That's the important thing. That's what we need there, that they're users of the theory. And they apply these um, like certain rules for reasoning, like quantum mechanics and consistency with each other. Now, one can actually put this into a figure as before, when we, uh, we have different agents. And each agent has a certain range to which he applies the theory. So it's now not, this diagram is not, um, I mean, I'm not, uh, this is, uh, this is rather complicated. It's just to show that one can draw it. One can really go to the thought experiment and ask oneself, what should the individual agents do? Or what do they do in our argument? And then one can, for example, find out that one of the agents, agent F, the one who is invoked first, applies, like describes this part of the thought experiment, which, for example, includes agent F and so the measurement device as part of the theory, but not for example, this agent who is got black for some reason. So um, there, there are these kind of circles. And so it, this is just to say that in general, we may have very complicated situations where different agents apply the theory to different parts of the world. The important thing is that neither of the agents applies the theory to herself. That's, of course, important. So, I mean, this is really red, even on my screen. I don't know. This is maybe now an example of a fact that we cannot, or the projector cannot agree with this thing. But this is really strange. OK. Maybe this is really true. <laughs> OK. Anyway. Um, so just to remind you, <laughs> because that's one of the important points, an agent is a user of a theory. And I'm now coming to the second part of the talk, where I want to make um, like the following point. If in, in the discussions we have heard this morning, and I really appreciate in particular Matt's effort to make things very precise and, and, and to kind of bring order into these interpretations. Um, I still feel at the end we are often talking about things which seem like we will never have a chance to kind of really make an operational statement in some way. And I've, I'm coming from this side of quantum information where I always try to make things operational. So the question is, can we in an operational way talk about these things? And can we even at the end do an experiment? And of course, an experiment will, um, I mean, like a Bell experiment, we put in assumptions and so on. But the proposal I would like to make is what we can do is, and, and this is maybe has now a different focus. We don't now test nature. So I'm not proposing to do an experiment to test nature here. So it's different from what Bell tested. I'm proposing an experiment to test 
whether actually someone can come up with an unambiguous definition of what quantum theory is and how it should be applied. And uh, uh, let me try to, this, try to make this more precise. So this is a strange type of experiment. So let me again stress that because people say this doesn't make sense to do this whole Wigner's friend experiment actually experimentally. So that's really not the point. The point is to kind of force people who say that um, they understand quantum mechanics to be precise and then see whether things work. The first thing to realize is that because a, an agent is a user of quantum theory, the best way, in my opinion, to think about such a user is to just take a computer. Because a u what is a user of quantum theory? It gets some description, some rules, how to apply the theory, and at the end, um, make certain statements. Now, these statements don't necessarily have to be predictions, or whatever, but the theory, I mean, if I talk about the use of the theory, then there should the use should reflect itself by certain things I can say at the end. That's maybe a minimal thing. On the other hand, the computer is, of course, also an object that I can describe with quantum theory. So I have this duality here, which is um, here illustrated. So the reason why I'm now taking a computer as an agent is that it's clear that, and doesn't mix in concepts like consciousness, that it can be the subject and the object in this sense. Now, um, the idea is, um, as I've mentioned, that we, we would really take, so the computer should be a user of quantum theory, which means that it's programmed with the rules. It's, it's programmed with what we would do. And if quantum theory is unambiguously defined, one could say there should really be a set of rules that tells us for any description of an experiment what statements we can derive and um, what we can say or what we cannot say. That could also be that. It could be that there is a description. Computer decides, oh, I cannot make a statement about it. That's outside the scope of the theory. But there should, it should be well defined. That's my only thing. It should be defined what the statements are. Now, of course, to, to go to a multi-agent scenario, I have to allow something like this, that I have a description of that in the world, some other agent gets an input and does something. and I um, so the rules should include rules to reason about um, that situation. Because, um, yeah, this is just because I have multi-agent scenarios. I could, of course, now exclude any such things, but then they never talk about, they can never communicate, so to speak. So that's, you could say that's, that's the minimal thing we do when we communicate. Because, of course, when I say something to someone, I first of all just know that he now got what I said, and, or I know he said this, but then I want to kind of make sense of it, so I have to kind of um, go one level, level higher in this sense. So that's always necessary. Now, um, the, the idea is to make this so precise that we have at the end really a program in a computer, pro in a language, in a language in which we can program computers where we just have this set of rules and can describe everything. And at the end, we have a certain set of statements. And whether this, so the statements um, can in principle be of any type, but I have now certain assumptions, or I will now, of course, at some point, I have to specify what the rules are. And these rules will kind of make sense of this statement. So you could say, OK, what does certain mean? What do you mean by that? That's irrelevant at this point, because the rules, I will now tell you, will kind of, in some way, interpret that in the following way. So essentially, for the SOT experiment that we are considering, the computer should roughly follow these three rules. And so what are these rules? So one rule is, is really like um, in this particular case, usually um, the Born rule in the case of probability one, which makes it easier. This is just a simplification that we don't need to put in any interpretation of probability. That would just make it much harder to kind of, how would you program that in such a way that people agree what it means and so on. So this is just to say when, a, when you feed the computer with a um, description of the experiment and he finds out that according to quantum mechanics, an outcome has to be, or the norm of the state is one after projection, then he can make that claim. Now, again, this is not to be interpreted. It's just a text, so to speak. It's just it outputs that text. May I ask a question? Yes. So, so you're focusing on probability zero and one. Yes. And you just said 
so that we don't have to worry about the interpretation mm -hmm. yes. of probability. Yes, right. What would you say to the stubborn subjective Bayesian oh, who I, says that yes. probability one is a so, belief I would say, as opposed yes. to, um, I don't know if there's a happy frequentist yes. in yes. there. So I would say, who, who I, says even yes. probability yes. one is subject yes. to interpretation. I think it's perfectly fine because what I'm saying, the rule just says whenever this is one output, this statement. Now, that just means you have to interpret for you, for the moment, this statement that certain means you're just certain, but it's not, um, I mean, you can give now any interpretation to the word certain at this point because I didn't say what certain means. And if certain means whatever it means for you, for example, that it could still not be true, there's still a kind of, you could be wrong, that's fine at this point. Because at this point, this is really just a text that is output, so to speak. So don't interpret that. That's why I have this quote. It's just a text. It's just a rule that says, if this is the case, output this text, so to speak. Yes? So uh, you, you've managed to confuse me again in response to what Chris said. I'm sorry because for that. If, <laughs> so it sounds like you're basically proposing that there's some program, I could, some Python script I can yes, write that right. takes one string of LaTeX yes. and outputs another yes, string of LaTeX. Exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. So far. So of course, that's then, not all. So, uh, <laughs> but, so, but what, what it's doing here is taking in a light yes. and one string of LaTeX yes, that has exactly. a factor yes. pi, yes. underscore z, and yes. so on. Yes. Um, Maybe I should briefly continue then, come, because I guess the, I know what Then I don't understand the importance of probability one at yes. all yes. if you're leaving yes. certainty up yes. for further yes. interpretation. At this point, it's indeed not clear. So let me briefly show you the next two slides and then come back to this. Okay. I mean, it has to be, no, so you're right to ask this question because indeed it's not clear. I should. Um, so at this point, it's just a text. And also here I could say, if you have such a situation, of course, that would be itself a text which is now illustrated that says um, the computer knows that, then this text is transformed into that text. Now, these are just rules, but now there's a third rule. And this is now still just the text, but this rule interprets the text in some way. So that's the, uh, so what does this rule do? It says whenever I end up with a text of this form, then I say, stop, this shouldn't happen. Now we have arrived at the contradiction. So you could say now the interpretation of what certain means is in this rule here. Because here it says whenever after all these reasoning processes, the computer arrive at outputting such a text, which so far you could take just as a string, but of course you want to interpret it in any way. Then you say, this is now undesirable. Now at this point, Chris could come and say, okay, I'm, my interpretation of certain is such that I don't buy this rule. I, I'm happy with that thing. I don't <laughs> stop. And that would be the answer now. I would say that if you really insist on saying probability one, doesn't mean, I mean, let's say if you say something happens with probability one and you, at the end you see it doesn't happen, you're fine. You think, okay, that's okay. And you are allowed to do that, but that would just mean you don't um, put in this rule. Now, um, of course, one can now debate whether this is a useful rule, but this is the point where, where things enter. And I think this is also the answer to your question, because now one can say, if you, whatever interpretation of certain you have, if your interpretation of certain is so weak that you think this is not a problem, that it's unproblematic to make this statement, I'm certain that z is zero, and I'm also certain that z is not zero, then that's fine. Th that's the point where you have to decide, essentially. But you still seem unsatisfied with my statement. Well, I, I, I'm still not understanding really what this rule S is about because it looks like you're just logically checking the syntax of the statement. Yes. It's like it's like getting a syntax error when I type a line into my Python interpreter. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it seems like yes. all that, that that's all that this rule is checking. Yes. So. It's not even something as sophisticated as what the idea. So the idea is, a priori, these are just strings. So this program, I mean, that's what the program does. It gets some input and outputs a string. It doesn't do anything else. And now it's, of course, we usually interpret these strings. And so that these rules are of that type. They get something in and they put something out. But then I, um, at some point, 
say certain strings are undesirable. And that kind of gives a meaning to the strings. Because so far they were just strings, and at the end I say which of the strings are undesirable. Um, and that's kind of the, the minimum way of saying um, kind of how I give meaning to text. So th there's no more meaning to the text than at the end. I mean, that is required for this. Of course, we usually give that meaning. I'm not saying that we, in, in our normal interpretation of quantum mechanics, we, we assign much more to that. And the text should, of course, make sense for us. But just for the strict argument here, for the contradiction, I said the only thing I need from this text, you can have, you have a lot of freedom of how you interpret it. We only have to agree on the fact that once we see the text of this form, then this means we are not happy. We, we say this is now showing that the rules are not good rules. Why do you say undecidable? This sounds more like a blatant contradiction or like a... Undecidable. Undecidable. You said you, you mentioned undesirable. undecidability. Sorry, I said undesirable. Undesirable. Yes, Sorry. I'm just my so ears. Yes, no, probably. <laughs> So, um, um, so it's just uh, so um, we have these three rules, and you can now say what strictly speaking, what we are saying is that when we program computers with these three rules, we could ask the question: Do we ever get to this point where it says, where it? Uh, I mean, this is just let's say it aborts in this case, or a red lamp goes shows off and says something went wrong. So the question is kind of when we just apply these rules, do we ever reach the point where this light red, red light goes off? And the statement then is, yes, if we apply to the thought experiment, then this happens. And now you can go back and say, well, OK, um, is this problematic? And that's where interpretation starts. Yes? Um, let me pretend for a moment, which is, which yes. is actually true, that I know emotional physics, but I'm a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Then rule C seems to me, well, of course, I understand you want me just mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. You take them at their own value for mm -hmm. now, and I, yeah. and I will, yes. of course. Um, you know, interesting. I mean, if a, a lawyer might say certainty derives from evidence. Mm -hmm. And so I, I hear that, that Bob is certain of some proposition, mm -hmm. um, which is evidentiary in, yes. in the way in which he reaches that certainty. I, I, you know, with with the best will in the world, not trying to be a difficult probabilist who worries about probabilities one in zero, might say, well, you know, that certainly affects how I think about the proposition in question. But for certainty, I need my own evidentiary argument, and if my evidence is not his evidence, I can't necessarily reach that conclusion. Sorry for the ramble. I'm not. Yes. I, I'm, pointing to the fact that, that it's a very interesting axiom. Yes. But I, I, I think okay. it could go by a little fast. Yes. Uh, okay. In some sense, by um, not committing to the modality you have in mind, mm -hmm. you're making it look a little, like goes down a little more easily than it might. Mm -hmm. Yes. So first I should say, um, of course, um, this rule only makes sense if we know that all these computers are programmed with the same rules according to the same theory. So it's not like in law where someone tries to lie or cheat someone else. So it's kind of, we are in a, I should have stressed that, so I'm grateful you asked this. So in, in some way, of course, to motivate this rule, I can always write it down, but to motivate it, and I should say, OK, I only want this rule to be enforced if I program the computers all with the same rules. So they all use the same set and then this makes sense. Now, there are, again, there are just rules, but we could say, um, so I really I use this term desirable <laughs> in the sense that um, maybe there's something else we can replace it with and w I would also be happy with. I, I want, don't want, I mean, that's a possibility, which is probably even likely, but um, it's at least something we, we tend to use. It's in that sense desirable. And now, the, I would also give that answer to your certain if you say, okay, you have a theory in which certain has a meaning which doesn't allow me to say that this is really problematic at the end. So, so far it didn't give any meaning, but now you say, okay, your interpretation of what certain means doesn't justify to say then al al alarm should go off and say something went really, truly wrong. Then this is fine. That's just a choice you make and you say, okay, you have such a loose interpretation of certain that for you such a statement is not a worry. That's perfectly fine. So it's not, um, 
it's, it's really there where you have the choice. So by saying that certain, yeah, this really, this, this rule gives meaning to the, to the, to the so thing, certain, and if you. It's supposed to be a probabilistic statement when I say I'm certain that something falls. It's just, uh, yeah, so th that's the, really the idea behind that is that it doesn't matter. The, the idea is that take any meaning of, because the rules, you see the different rules refer to that. So whenever you have that, it calls it certain. It's just the word certain. I could call it blah. I mean, what, what work does that do for you then? Why couldn't you just say, um, I don't understand, it, this is a, a version of Blake's question. Mm -hmm. I don't see what work it does for you to change from oh, because the, I, the I left side the rules to the right. Together. Because you see the certain is again enters here. So I, I have three rules which talk about certain. And you can replace this word by something else, but of course it has to. Well, then why don't I just simply replace it with the probability one? one you could also say just, um, I write, whenever I write certain probability one, and then this actually means if, um, if this uh, blue computer has probability one, has said it has probability one. So I can replace it with any term you like. So indeed, I could just say whenever the word certain appears, write probability one. That's fine. And then the statement here just says, if, um, I'm, if I have probability that the outcome is zero and I have probability one that the outcome is also not zero, then um, I'm unhappy, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. So that's an equivalent way to do everything. It's so certain is in that sense just a word to remind ourselves kind of what we want so that we can kind of make sense of the, how we subdivide these rules into. Somehow I would like to support this. I mean, if you have no matter what the fact of the world is, I mean, mm -hmm. of what, what yeah. objective is, if you have a normative rule that I'm certain that A is true and I'm certain that A is false, you are unsatisfied. Yeah. I don't oh, think we, well, we would say that. Yeah, certain. so we don't, if, if by certain we mean I don't think we really gain anything in this discussion. Oh, yes. Asking, is this really? Yes, then yes but that's why I want to bring it down yeah. to that point. Yeah. It's funny that it focuses on this so much because that, isn't there another aspect which is. Um, that um, unperformed measurements have no outcomes, even in the case of certainty. And when you can, can you bring up the the, the rule when, when it goes from one to the other? You see, and this one, or no, sorry, no, the other one, one, the other one. Yes, this one, yes. Um, so what in, in quantum mechanics certainty refers to expected measurement outcomes, mm -hmm. right? So the only certainty that the computer on the right can have that if it asked the root computer, mm -hmm. it would get that answer. Mm -hmm. Yes. And from that certainty, since unperformed measurements have no outcomes, mm -hmm. from that certainty you cannot automatically infer that that is, the, the, mm -hmm. that, that, that is actually the case without asking. Yes. So basically you, mm -hmm. you, you uh, jump to the conclusion yes. without asking and thereby ignoring that unperformed measurements uh, have no outcomes or that measurements actually have effects. Yes. And actually in this whole thought experiment that is, is vital because if you did the experiment, mm -hmm. if you did ask, mm -hmm. you would destroy your whole, yes. your, your whole construction. Okay. So that's a perfect example of why yes. performing a measurement has an effect mm -hmm. and matters. Okay, but what you're saying is just you're giving arguments why you don't want to have this rule. Yes. That's what you're saying, which is fine because that's exactly what cubism doesn't satisfy. So I have nothing really to say, except that I would it, um, what I will do at the end is to say that if you don't have such rules, okay. then we are in deep trouble. But and so I you want to replace it by something I else. I agree, but, but some of this, this whole discussion of certainty seem to, seem to be almost, almost pain cubism as ridiculous because we focus on the certainty, but the certainty actually, the problem is a different one. It's, it's the yes, one I, mean, I, agree. I mean, I would say, despite the fact that you asked, yeah. and I'm not claiming that cubism should, would abolish this. I mean, maybe that's what you want, but I, I don't think it, no, you want that. Not, who, exactly. would, who would want yes, to arrive? Right, exactly. uh, under, so agree just like Chaslov said, under yes, any yeah. notion of certainty, yes, right. you wouldn't want to accept A right. and not A. Yes, but, yes. But exactly. We yes. Say, that's the point here. Yeah. Um, we could, we could so. define certain as the thing that we want to satisfy, this property that it cannot be. Yes, X exactly. X. That would be another way to say it. Plug yes. in whatever you want, probability one. Only call something certain if it satisfies this rule here. If you are, so you should only call something certain if, if, it, if the opposite happens, you're really unhappy. Otherwise, don't call it certain. So yes, that's a very good point. <laughs> so I think that's a nice but way I'm to put it. I'm still stumped on why the translation that you had previously does 
any work for you at all. This one? Any conceptual work. Oh, so this is just, um, here on the left hand side we have elements of the zero like the U and the projector and at some point I don't want to always carry that with me because I chain the rule. It's like logical interference where I have like pieces of rules and I, so, but of course I could write just here, I'm, I have probability, so the probability that the measurement has outcome set is one. That would be just another phrasing. This that wouldn't change anything, it's just another way of representing the same kind of information. Um, then, and would it be fair to say that I am certain that dot 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 is just the form that the outputs of these concluding machines takes? Mm -hmm. so, um, right, so, oh, so it's, it's yeah. sort of yes. a wrapper saying this machine has concluded that or something like that. Yes, you could. Yeah. Yes, you're kind of talking about them. I mean, which means the machine. And then you want to yes. go to. You have yes. to go to the yes. second level. So yes. this is. But just to um, make sure we are now again on common ground. So I agree with Rüdiger that what um, cubism would not lie is this rule. So that's. Uh, I think we are here on the same. Well, and uh, whether you call this now unperformed measurements have no outcome. There, I'm. I'm less happy with this, and I will come back to why. Um, so let me come back to that because I don't, I wouldn't agree with that statement why it's not true. But I agree that this is the problematic thing within cubism and not that one. That's, I perfectly agree with. Anyway, so um, now I think, what's the time, by the way? Or should I? Because um, I don't. A bit late, so you okay, so I'll just, I had some the slides the about the, how we analyze the salt experiments, which is. Um, just to say that then these rules are applied, but I think you can imagine how this is done. So I will, um, I mean, because that's really something if I want, I mean, I didn't plan to go through that. I just had some individual steps illustrating how the rules are applied. But I think you can imagine this. Oh, now I see it. So it's there's just no red color in this projector. That's why everything that is red appears black. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe it's just the. Okay, this, okay, um, now, um, <laughs> I, I can already almost jump um, to the conclusions and I want to then make one more statement about what Rüdiger just said before. But what's the main, what's the take home message of, of this thing? So the take home message is that I really want to bring this down to a kind of what I call a challenge. Namely that everyone here who is now saying, okay, it's this is the problem and that is the problem. And of course, I, I still almost daily receive emails telling me what is wrong in this thought experiment. So that's why I now, daily. yes, literally, daily, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and um, yes, so I, um, that's I think the motivation behind the work I'm now doing with um, in particular Lydia and Nuria and, and, um, and Simon Mattis, um, that we want to put up a challenge. And the challenge is the following. So I think, at least what you should, I mean, accept whatever interpretation you have is, it should be able to put it at the end, at the end in, in concrete rules of what you do if you have a concrete experiment. And the experiment is described. This is something you could in principle do, in particular if they are computers. Because if they are computers, we don't need to worry about, oh, can we now simulate a human or not? So they're just physical things. So I think that's not the problematic. We can put everything into rules. Now. The challenge is to find rules such that when you program the computers in this thought experiment, there will no computer will ever um, leave the, the red flag or this red light and say, I arrived at this contradiction. Actually, you could even, um, yeah, I mean, and of course, the computer should do that before it's measured. So it's not allowed that once the computer has been measured, it raises a red flag. So only as long as it's still a working computer. I just stress that because of um, Scott Aronson is constantly insisting that I'm making the error of saying that, of course, we cannot think when we are hot martyred because he thinks this computer still makes conclusions once it has been measured. This is simply not the case in this thought experiment. In this thought experiment, the computers are only supposed to work before a measurement is applied to them. It's not needed that they do anything afterwards. Well, it would raise the superposition of a flag and no Yes, right. And that's, I, I avoid that. So the experiment is exactly designed in such a way that we don't need that. That's the whole point why there is a certain timing. That, so it has some timing when everyone has to do things. So for example, when this computer talks about that one, it's important that this computer hasn't been measured because otherwise it talks about something that no longer exists according to certain interpretations and so. So that's, the timing is important, let me just say that. 
But now, this is the caveat. Of course, it's kind of quite easy to make a theory where there's no contradiction arising here. For example, you can just say, give up, the, give up assumption C. That's what, for example, Rüdiger would do, and I agree with one should probably do that. But what you also have to do in this challenge is you still have to, so the, the rules that you program the computers, which if I program now computers in a very daily life situation, and this is just supposed to be a normal communication task, this, com this agent tells something to that agent, and then this agent should kind of be able to make sense of this. In the usual way as we talk, I mean, um, okay, this is now not spelled out precisely, but I think you can imagine what it, or probably spelling it really out then is, is of course maybe then at the end still challenging, but um, so we have certain, I mean, we know what daily life situations we have, for example, that I now talk to you and you should kind of um, somehow be able to make sense of it. Maybe that's not possible for my talk, but at least for others maybe. So this is the um, kind of the counter check. So it's not sufficient to lift just something and not replace it. You have still to be able to say, um, what do you replace it with such that we don't get empty statements in daily life situations. And this also now is something I wanted maybe to relate to the talk that um, Katrin gave in, in the APS meeting about many worlds. There are these extreme forms of many worlds where you say there is branches don't really make sense. It's just at any point in time there's a wave function and there's no other like a wave function or the branch or the world here is not connected to anything in, in the second or the second in the past and so on. In this case, it's not clear what statements we can still make other than the type of statements like um, I know at any point which worlds are possible. That's then the type of statement. But that's not a statement that would allow me to do anything I do usually in daily life, probably. And so the challenge is really to, to still have enough structure and rules that allow us to do things that we usually do and nevertheless not run into a contradiction. That's really the tension. I think that's the challenge, which hasn't I haven't seen a solution to that. Usually um, people just say what, to, what is a bad assumption, but they would then not be able to any longer do that because just as an example, typically it said, um, if you have, um, just don't talk about um, things where you have interfering branches or where you have interferences or, or superposition. But of course, if you have now kind of an interpretation without the collapse, then we have all the time superpositions. And now, okay, you could say, oh, but they don't interfere. But then you have to, again, pre specify what does it mean that they interfere with respect to which basis and so on. So as soon as you um, are asked to really make it work, it, it needs to be specified. And then it's, it's not clear what actually the differences are. Although they seem, it seems obvious that this is a much more complicated situation than here, to really spell out what is now not allowed there and here it is, seems to be a very hard task, which at least I haven't seen or a way to solve. And that's where I would like to end here, because I would really love if someone could kind of solve this task. Because I think this is somewhat a necessary thing to do, because if we want to claim that we understand quantum theory, we should still understand it in a way such that the things we do in normal situations work. But of course, we don't want to run into a contradiction. Okay. That's all. Thank you for the attention. <laughs> yes? I have a question regarding the statements of, of the computers when you say they need to make them before they are themselves measured. So if mm -hmm. your friend, one computer, makes this prediction of Wigner will definitely see fail, that is as good as him revealing the result he actually observed before he's measured, which mm -hmm. I think should collapse the superposition state with respect to the agent who will measure him. Uh, ah, so okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure now what you mean by it should collapse anything. So I'm, of, of course, if now you're probably it's referring to a collapse model or? No, or but if Wigner has a classical record of the actual result, the uh -huh. probabilities he uh -huh. measures, okay. like, Let me corresponds to the When I say the computers output these things, then of course the idea is still that if a computer is, for example, in an isolated box, then this output remains in this box. That's a part of this setting. So you could now see, then you don't see it, but the computer would itself, so no one reads this outcome, but the computer, if it reached the contradiction, could still 
So let's suppose the box explodes in case it gets a contradiction. But otherwise, it doesn't reveal anything to the outside. So it's not that. Yes, I should have. So if this computer makes a statement, for example, this guy will measure OK. This statement remains in the box. Only if the red flag is raised, let's say, then the box would. That's the only information that would, would be allowed to leave the lab, if you like. Anyway, in this sort of experiment, it's usually that computer that but makes the contradiction. If you have then this in the superposition of the coin state, these yeah. two statements, like will C fail and might still yes. see OK, and then you like recomp like should this effect, you, you can then never read this out. But it will, yes, it will never be read out. Yes, that's right. I mean, that's the, really the idea of the isolated box. And it has to remain isolated, even when these computers act as agents and do their reasoning. The reasoning stays completely in the box. Then I'm not entirely sure where the contradiction is supposed to be seen. OK, I also know, don't know where the contradiction yes. is. It somewhere arises because there are statements that, at the end, if you combine them. So yeah, I don't you, you don't have okay this, no, no one has the statements. That's the point. I mean, you can combine oh, them yeah. from an okay. from an abstract. In the usual analysis, which I now didn't show, um, the contradiction arises at the end in the last computer, but not because the last computer has actually seen that thing. But um, actually, maybe this is an opportunity to briefly also give an answer to Rüdiger, who says unperformed measurements don't have an outcome. It has maybe to do with that. So I think it's indeed true that if you take this assumption C, you could say, um, let me just give an example. I ask Rüdiger something like, do you leave today um, to the airport? And then he gives an answer and says, yes. Now I could say, do I now know whether Rüdiger will leave today? I would say, now I would have to ask him again, because I'm just certain, because he told me that in the past. So I'm certain, but actually, I'm only certain. <laughs> I, I have to ask again to really now confirm whether it's certain. So I would have to measure you again. So the question is, when is it sufficient to be certain? You would now say, no, this is stupid. You already told me. But I could say, no, but I'm, after you told me, I'm just certain. It's not that I. So in some way, you would have to specify in this program, when is it OK to no longer measure <laughs> and really be happy with what you told me, and when would I have to consistently ask you all? I think there's a simple answer. Whenever, whenever the um, asking the question makes a difference. So for instance, you asking mm -hmm. me might, might change my mind about it. Yes. That's, okay. the, yes. that's the kind of way yes. it matters. Okay. Not, not that yes. from the first to the second answer yes. I might change okay, my that, mind. That, that's that's a good answer. Act, and, so, and we have but actually rules. We have quantum mechanics yes. that tells me whether asking the question makes a difference or not. Yes. Yes. And in this case, it clearly does make a difference. Because asking the question, question getting the answer would actually change the, uh, change the entire game. This is why you have to have to sort of uh, have this sort of mm -hmm. this this way of phrasing C because you, you, you cannot afford to ask the question because asking the question makes a difference. So this is where you have this why why you have this 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 way of thinking, just basically speculating about the internal state of your other agent. Isn't that true? Um, yeah, so, OK, there are two things I should say to that. So, um, so first of all, if I'm already certain about something, like I'm certain that the state is, or let's say I'm certain a certain value is 1, if I now measure that value again, and if it really, if I was correct and the value was kind of 1, I will not change that at all. So it, I only change a value about which I wasn't completely certain. So I would claim this, it's not true that, so if, I mean, this is just a quantum mechanical statement. If, if I have a qubit, which can be any state, and I know for certain it's 0, and now you tell me I should confirm it again, I project it again onto 0, then it will not change it. But you're narrowing it too much, because clearly you have constructed a very nice, complicated experiment where it makes a difference whether you ask the question or not. And it depends on what, uh, I mean, I can always ask a question, and then um, you don't even need to listen to me when I ask the question. So it w of course, you could say, if you then really do something different because I asked the question. So I mean, let's say, I think this is really illustrating that we should do this challenge. Because at the end, you would need to specify what you mean by asking a question changes things. And if you just mean it's applying the projector operator again, then it doesn't. But if you mean something else, it does. So I think 
that's why we have this challenge, exactly to clarify such discussions. I don't think we can clarify now. Um, we had already many discussions, made a lot of progress. But I think the purpose of this challenge is to force people to be very precise what they mean. And um, I would be happy if you can solve it in that way. So uh, it's not that I'm, I would try to say you, you will not be able to do it. I'm extremely happy if you find a rule and say it's a very defined rule where you can say, oh, if this and this happens, then um, we cannot apply C and otherwise we can. I would be very, very happy with that. So I'm not trying to hold, uh, but I haven't seen that, unfortunately. From what you said, I have the gut feeling that um, it would be quite helpful to try to make a formal system out of that. Right. That is to, 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 to codify what kind of statements you want to include. Also, whether you make a distinction between agents, like things that make predictions and the rest of the mm -hmm. rest of physics or so, um, and what kind of statements you would actually include. I think forcing you to, to put this into a formal framework would also tell you something about the possible primitives here. So, so you, you see that you left something out when you, when you try to do such a formalization. Yes. So, so I uh, and I, 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 I suspect you've, tr you've, yeah, you've yeah, started I mean, doing that. Work right? with Lydia and um, this is really, we, we actually have, we put this into a programming, I don't know whether you, by formal framework, I mean, we, we put kind of a program, a software framework where at the end you can say um, everyone, of course, if the rule has any meaning, there's a software code that then fits into this package where you can say, okay, I mean, we can kind of the program, the framework would, I mean, there would be a framework within which you can then define these rules. And yes, so it's a programming language, and in that sense, completely formal. That's ex yes, that's exactly what we want to do. So at the end, it will really, ideally should be that someone could send us a code and say, this is how I interpret quantum mechanics, check whether it works, and then one could decide this question. And what the claim, or what I would really love to see, so I think I should stress that I'm not, I'm not trying to insist there has to be a problem, but I think the solution, I'm just saying what the solution should satisfy is that it should here not lead to a contradiction, but here still give a result. And um, so I guess um, when we disagree, Rüdiger and I, then it's not that I disagree because I think um, it would be an undesirable thing. It's rather that I haven't seen it and I would love to see it. And um, yes, so that's really. Uh, okay, so we'll just have Lorenzo and then we'll break. For mm -hmm. Yeah, so I don't know if this helps to yeah, win the challenge, but so at least what what troubled me and what I tried also to say this morning is that in this case, assumption C is something that according to me is not very natural, that you assume that you can promote another certainty, even if that certainty happened, let's say, in the past, and in the while there is the erasure about that certainty being erased, the information about the certainty being erased. And so if you change the assumption C by saying, you know, I can say that uh, this certainty at time t0 becomes my certainty at time t1, modulo there is no erasure happening mm -hmm. about that outcome, then you wouldn't fall into contradiction. Because, uh, okay. for example, Wigner bar couldn't make it. Oh, actually, um, I didn't say that, but I'm grateful you asked, because that's indeed often a concern. So. Actually, it is the case that whenever <coughs> assumption C is applied, the assumption C refers to knowledge that is still around and could therefore be checked operationally. So for example, um, I didn't show this slide but, um, before, but this is an uh, instance in the SORT experiment. And all instances are like that, that for example, the green computer says something about the blue one. Now, um, the time at which it does this interference is before the blue one has been measured. So it's really talking about, the content, if you want, on the screen of this computer. So let's suppose the blue computer shows something on the screen. Later, the blue computer will be measured. So that's probably your concern, but that's happening later. But before the blue computer is measured, the green computer makes this inference, knows what is on the screen of the blue, and says, OK, now I know the blue computer shows this on its screen. Let me promote it to my own knowledge. And only then, after the green computer, so to speak, has saved this knowledge, so it's like, you could see it as a memory of the blue one. If you, I mean, that's just a way to phrase it. But only then the blue is measured. So it's important that in the C, if you, I didn't now specify it with times, but indeed it's restricted to such things. It's not that I'm saying, oh, because I know you were certain a year ago, but in the meantime I've forgotten. That's why I do it. It's really I'm certain now that you think that. That's why I think that as well. 
And if you go through the sort experiment, you will see that whenever I apply C, it's about knowledge of the other that is still could be checked. You could stop the experiment at this point and see, is it true that what the green computer thinks about the blue is correct? And that would be tested then. So it would indeed otherwise be a concern. But I be, that's why we have a very particular timing in the experiment. So it's, it's really important that you do the steps in, in a particular order. It's not just that you can, like in the Bell experiment where you do, so the order has to be very particular and it's like in a chain.